before we get started, uh, I just want to start with a survey. Uh, and I'm going to ask you three questions because I'm very interested in knowing who drives electric vehicles and how many people here tonight drive electric vehicles. So the, first, the three questions are about the three types of electric vehicles. So firstly, could I have a show of hands, please, for people who drive a hybrid vehicle like a Toyota Prius or a Honda Insight? Okay. So we've got about three people. Okay. Um, Next, um, who drives, can I have a show of hands for people who drive a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle like a Holden Volt or a BMW i8? Okay, we've got one over here. Great. Okay. And next, um, could I have a show of hands for people who drive full electric vehicles like a Nissan Leaf or a Tesla S? So, here, three, four, 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 five. Great. Okay. Well, I can tell you that electric vehicle owners and drivers are well represented here tonight, um, and an over-representation of the population in New Zealand who drive electric vehicles, which is about 0.015% of New Zealand's population, and 0.02% of the 2.7 million light passenger vehicles we have in New Zealand. And um, we... Uh, in the Green Grid project that I'm running, I'm working with some uh, social scientists who model the diffusion of technologies through society using a curve like this. And they talk about innovators being the very first people who take up a new technology, then followed by early adopters, then the early majority, the late majority, and right at the end of the laggards. Uh, well, uh, everyone who has an electric vehicle here tonight is an innovator, is very much in that innovator category. Uh, but what if we all drove electric vehicles? And that's what I want to look at tonight. I'm going to look firstly at the envir environmental aspects of us all driving electric vehicles. Then I'll move on to look at the impact on the grid, the electricity grid, and fi finish by looking at the skills need for driving electric vehicles in New Zealand. But I want to start off with a bit of history about electric vehicles and an introduction to the technology in electric vehicles. So starting off with the history and technology of electric vehicles, and we need to start with electric motors because it is, after all, electric motors that drive are the prime movers of electric vehicles. Electric motors all started with a, an English scientist called Michael Faraday. Um, in 1821, he built the first ever electric motor. Uh, and I do have a, an example of that here tonight. And if, if we have time later on, I'll try and get it going. Um, now, Far Faraday knew that a wire carrying a current in a magnetic field would ex experiences a force and causes that wire to move. And it was that principle he used to build this electric motor. But Faraday, and what he's most famously known for, is he supposed that surely if a wire is moved in a magnetic field, then it will cause a current to flow in the wire. And that is known as Faraday's law. And it is a fundamental law that um, is used in all of electricity today and electric motors. Next, um, in about 1840, Thomas Davenport built the first DC motor. And you can see a um, fairly primitive commutator down there, which is used to reverse the polarity as it spins. Um, and he tried to commercialize this. He actually managed to use it to build a model railway. Tried to commercialize it, but unfortunately went bankrupt. Uh, that was followed by, in, the, in 1887, Nikola Tesla, a Yugoslavian inventor. Uh, and Nikola Tesla is famous for many things, but the, probably the most important and most fundamental is the induction motor. And that's a model of Nikola Tesla's induction motor there. Now, the induction motor, and I've got an example of one here, um, a very simple example of an induction motor. Uh, it's built on Faraday's law. So by supplying it with three-phase alternating current and at the way in which it's wound around the stator, which is this outside part, creates a rotating magnetic field. And remember Faraday's law, if a wire in a moving magnetic field, uh, a wire in a moving magnetic field has a current induced in it. And that current is induced in these wires in the rotor. And in turn, that causes the rotor to spin. So... A 
rotating magnetic field from three-phase electricity around the stator causes the rotor to spin. And the fantastic thing about induction motors is they don't require any electrical connection for, uh, to the rotating rotor. So there's no brushes uh, which, or commutators which tend to wear out very quickly. Um, now, Nikola Tesla's inventions, um, including the induction motor, AC electricity and generation of AC electricity would commercialized by George Westinghouse who purchased royalties to his inventions. Uh, and there's an example of an 1890 um, motor, induction motor of George Westinghouse's. It's about 200 kilowatts. And indeed today you can buy Westinghouse induction motors. So these are what induction motors look like today. Um, there's an example of one here if you want to have a look at one after the lecture. Uh, it's been cut away so you can see what it's like inside. Um, now the induction motor is the workhorse of modern industry. In Germany and the USA, about 65% of power used from the grid is used by motors. And there's all sorts of industrial processes and things we do in the home, like fridges and heat pumps and all sorts of things that use, that, that have motors in them. Um, and now, today, we have electric vehicles with motors. This is the Tesla Model S, the only one in New Zealand. And this is the rear axle, the, the, this is the induction motor. It uses an induction motor on the rear axle and on the front. Each is 270 kilowatts. Uh, that's the induction motor. It's about that, that size, 270 kilowatts packed into that size. Here are the power electronics to control it. I'll talk a bit more about that later. It has a single gear, a reduction gear, and a differential here. That motor plus the one on the front are capable of taking that vehicle from zero to 104 seconds. The Nissan Leaf doesn't actually have an induction motor. It has a very similar concept, though. It's called a um, permanent magnet synchronous motor, which is just here. Now, what about electric vehicles in history? Electric vehicles have been around for over 100 years. They were around in the late 1800s. Um, one of the first electric vehicles was the Porsche P1, um, superseded by the Lona Porsche, which had motors built into the hubs. Um, and indeed, in 1899 and 1900, more than a quarter of the vehicles on the road were electric vehicles, and electric vehicles outsold any other vehicle. Edison, of course, was interested in electric vehicles, but more interested in the batteries to power electric vehicles. He had a couple of attempts at building battery technologies, tried to commercialize them, was unfortunately not successful. But just around this time of Thomas Edison shown here, Henry Ford came along and developed the first petrol powered car on the production line. And that spelt the end of the electric vehicle. And the question is why did the petrol powered car in the electric vehicle. And it comes down to the energy density of petrol and to some extent DC batteries and control of electric, the current from DC batteries into the motor. Um, petrol is, has a far greater en energy density than modern day lithium ion batteries which are the batteries used in the Nissan Leaf for example. In fact you can pack, there is packed in one litre, well, one kilogram of petrol 12 kilowatt hours of energy. And you think about a one bar heater, it's a kilowatt running for an hour. If it ran for 12 hours, that's how much many, uh, energy there is in a kilogram of petrol. Um, and by weight, so it's a factor of 100 times more energy dense by weight. By volume, it's 26 times more energy dense. So one kilogram of petrol you require 100 kilograms of lithium ion batteries to store the same amount of energy and much greater volume. Now, the, you know, there's a, there's a big question over will battery technology improve? And that's a question I can't answer, but I can say something about the pace of change of technology. Now, when I was, um, back in 1980, when I was at school, uh, my father purchased a TRS-80 computer. It was a state-of-the-art computer in those days. It had 16 kilobytes of RAM. Now, just to put that into perspective, the Epicenter newsletter, which is well worth a read, if you want to read it, it's on our website there. Um, our last one had 12,000 characters in it. That's characters, not even 
taking into account the images, which are much higher than the characters. Um, if each character is represented by a byte, that's about 12 kilobytes of text alone in our newsletter, which I just pack onto my phone, iPhone, easily these days. But it would hardly, only just fit into the memory of a 1980s state-of-the-art computer. These days, we can buy an iPhone 6S with 128 gigabytes of memory. And the, uh, I remember upgrading our TRS-80 to a 64 kilobyte RAM, and that was a big event. It was this thing under the screen. Has anyone here heard of Moore's Law? Yeah. So Moore's Law, uh, Moore was an uh, um, engineer working for Intel in the 1960s, and he suggested that every 18 months, the density of components on a silicon chip doubles. And in fact, that law has held for the last 50 years, every 18 months, the density of components on a silicon chip has doubled. And that is why devices now, that is why you can hold an iPhone in your hand, which is far more powerful than that, and has millions of times more memory. It, but I think people make a bit of a mistake in assuming that the same pace of change will happen with batteries. Um, 24 kilowatt hour battery is the battery in the Nissan Leaf. Um, historically, battery technology has doubled in density every 10 years. So, in fact, that's over that time, 35 years, roughly a factor of 11 times improvement. Um, the lithium ion battery was actually commercialized in the 1980s. So, we do need to be a bit careful with that. Uh, having said that, there's a huge amount of investment going into battery technology. Um, what silicon technology has brought us, however, is power electronics. And in the 1960s, engineers at the University of Canterbury started experimenting with electric cars again. They built uh, the first model, which is out at, actually out at Ferry Mead Heritage Park. Um, this is a model that they built in the 1970s, and then one in the 1980s. And uh, the, the electrical engineering department here are building several electric vehicles at the moment. And in fact, we've had students build electric vehicles. Um, what the power electronics gives us, which is, comes about through that revolution in silicon technology, is the um, high speed, high current switching devices to control motors like induction motors and the synchronous motors in the Nissan Leaf, uh, as well as the processing capability to control that power electronics. Now, I want to look now at the advantages of the electric vehicle. Well, firstly, the electric motor is far more efficient than the internal combustion engine. The electric motor is about 95% efficient, plus or minus. The internal combustion engine theoretically is 35% efficient. In reality, it's something like 17 to 20% efficient. So even though petrol has far higher energy density, there's not that much of it converted to useful motion of the vehicle. Most of it's thrown away as heat. Quite apart from that, um, I think it's pretty dangerous actually filling your vehicle up with petrol. Um, the other one is the motor and transmission weight. The Nissan Leaf, this is the motor transmission single uh, fixed ratio gear um, charger and inverter on a Nissan Leaf. It weighs 60 kilograms. Uh, on an equivalent Nissan vehicle, its uh, internal combustion engine vehicle, it weighs 200 kilograms. And why is that? Well, this is what you have under the bonnet of your cars. An internal combustion engine uh, with uh, a, a, a gearbox. Now, I, I must admit, this is being a bit unfair to the modern internal combustion engine. It is from a 1960s car. But um, the principle is still the same. Petrol has exploded to push these pistons down, uh, they move up, which converts that linear motion into a rotary motion. And because it only has a limited speed range, it requires a gearbox with five gears to convert that into useful uh, rotation for the wheels. Whereas an electric motor only requires a fixed reduction gear, it doesn't require any other gears. Regeneration, the ability when you put your foot on the brake in an electric vehicle to convert the kinetic energy of the vehicle, moving vehicle, back into useful energy stored in the batteries. 
Electric vehicles have that. It's Faraday's law in action. Um, internal combustion engines don't have it. When you put your foot on the brake, it just the motion, the kinetic energy just gets dissipated as heat. Running costs, and this is based on our experience of having an electric vehicle in Nissan Leaf, um, a round trip commute of 60 kilometres a day, in an internal combustion engine vehicle cost about 240 a month. It now costs us $40 of electricity a month. So that's a significant saving. However, the electric vehicle does have some disadvantages. And one is range. With that amount of energy packed into petrol, 60 litres of it in a tank of gas gives you a range of around about maybe 700 kilometres in a, a re reasonably efficient car. Um, an electric vehicle's range, a Nissan Leaf, maybe 130 kilometres, depending on how you drive. Um, a Tesla Model S, 426 kilometres. And the refill time. You can refill a petrol vehicle very quickly. 10 minutes to refill it. Um, an electric vehicle for those ranges shown there, 30 to 90 minutes on fast charge. And the purchase price, electric vehicles still cost a bit more. They have come down in price quite, quite a lot, and I think they will continue to come down in price. Um, but what about the environmental advantages? And just before I go on to environmental advantages of electric vehicles, I just want to quickly recap on the three main types of electric vehicles. There's the hybrid. Um, the primary energy to drive this is still petrol. Uh, it, it runs a motor, which um, an internal combustion engine which generates and um, can, uh, can drive the axle, uh, but when taking off from, say, the traffic lights, accelerating, um, the motor, electric motor, can be used for that using a small amount of energy stored in the battery. Um, or when braking, it does regenerate. So you get better efficiency. Um, but the advances have come with the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, like the Mitsubishi Outlander or BMW i8, uh, which does have an engine, internal combustion engine, uh, but it has a much larger, uh, much larger battery here. Um, and the primary driver for the axle is the uh, electric motor, although in some models, the engine can drive the axle. Um, but the engine can be used with a tank of gas to keep that battery charged up. Um, so it has the advantage of being able to um, extend the range of the vehicle, which is one of the reasons why people aren't so keen on electric vehicles. Um, and then there's the full electric vehicle, which is the simplest uh, electric vehicle, like the Nissan Leaf or the Tesla S model or Mitsubishi iMev. Um, it just has that electric motor that drives the car forward and uses power from the, um, the battery, which is stored with a plug and charger, uh, recharged with a plug and charger. Now, we've been working on the Green Good project with some social scientists to understand um, what are the factors influencing people's decisions and whether to buy electric vehicles or not. And uh, they are primarily the price, the range, and the charge time. So are they, they are big issues. And when, I, when we talk about range, you may have heard the term range anxiety, where people are concerned about their batteries running out. Um, barriers to purchasing are also charging and range battery technology. People concerned that it's moving at such a pace that they're buying an outda outdated technology. There's few models available, uh, and that is actually quite a big barrier. Um, and also brand aesthetics and comfort. Um, but motivations of people who do buy electric vehicles are environmental, um, economic, because as I showed you before, they do save a lot of money. And uh, they're also the innovators that I showed you on that first slide at the very beginning of that diffusion of technology curve. But on the subject of environmental aspects of electric vehicles, I want to look at that now. Now, as you know, New Zealand has an abundance of renewable energy. 80% of our electricity last year was generated from renewable energy sources. Hydro on the top left there, that's been more power station owned by Meridian Energy. Uh, generated 58% of our energy last year, electricity. Um, wind, that's West Wind Wind Farm, just near Wellington, near by Makara, uh, also owned by Meridian Energy. Uh, generated 5% of our energy last year. Um, geothermal, uh, that's Nara Arapura uh, Geothermal Power Station, just out of Taupo, 
that all geothermal generated 16% of our electricity last year. And the rest, uh, most of the rest, there's a little bit from biofuels and things, most of the rest was thermal um, from stations like Huntley Power Station, that's Huntley Power Station owned by Genesis Energy. But with all that renewable, what it means is that um, for domestic users, or residential use of electricity, the greenhouse gas emissions from our grid are quite low. Um, and comparatively, compared to the rest of the world, they're very low. So um, these are, this is grams of CO2 equivalent emissions from using electrical energy in residential settings. You can see New Zealand is quite up there. Um, countries like Norway and Iceland are ahead of New Zealand. Norway, and I, uh, Norway has over 90% renewable energy generation. Iceland is almost 100%. But then we go to countries like the UK, not so good. USA, not so good. And even worse is Australia and China. Um, and that's because Australia and China burn a lot of coal to generate electricity. So we have, we have last year 80% of renewable energy powering the grid, which puts us in a great position for electric vehicles. But before we go on to that, I just want to take a look at where our greenhouse gas emissions for the whole energy sector, for the whole of New Zealand come from. Um, this is a pie chart of where those greenhouse gas emissions come from, almost half from agriculture, 20% from in, uh, transport, the next highest uh, sector. And if we zoom in on the transport, 91% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from road transport. And then lo looking at the road transport, 65.5% roughly, it varies from year to year, come from light passenger vehicles, so the, the vehicles that we drive. So if we multiply all of that out, about 12% of New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions come from light passenger vehicles. That's quite a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from the vehicles we drive. And th this work that I'm showing you was done by one of my PhD students, um, Scott Lemon, who's here tonight, um, uh, for a, the National Energy Research Institute a few years ago. Um, but let's look at those 12% of emissions. What if we all converted to electric vehicles and we all drove electric vehicles? What would happen to those 12% of greenhouse gas emissions? Well, here's New Zealand here. That's our existing vehicle fleet. And comparatively speaking, it's actually quite inefficient. It creates quite a few greenhouse gases, because, partly because it's quite an old vehicle fleet, average age of around 13 years. Um, if we converted to electric vehicles based on, um, say, 74% renewable energy generation, then we'd reduce our greenhouse gases substantially. Uh, other countries, Norway, likewise, they have a lot to gain by conver converting to electric vehicles. Um, Netherlands a bit, Iceland a huge amount because they have so much renewable. Um, Estonia, an interesting example because they have actually um, promoted electric vehicles quite strongly, hardly any reduction because they burn so much coal. Um, likewise, with China and Australia, there's not too much potential for reduction. But New Zealand has a huge potential, potential to reduce its greenhouse gases by converting to an electric vehicle fleet. But ironically, when we rank ourselves worldwide, we have the, probably one of the lowest electric vehicle ownership per head of population or per uh, ex existing car in our vehicle fleet. Um, countries like Norway are well ahead. <clears throat> it's probably the world leader. And most of those are full electric vehicles. And you can see why. If we look back at that, the previous few slides, Norway has a, a, over 90% of its renewable electric, uh, electricity comes from renewable generation. Um, so you can see other countries here have much higher vehicle ownership, electric vehicle ownership per head of population uh, as a percentage of vehicles than New Zealand. So we have a huge amount to gain uh, by converting to electric vehicles. And just a, a few points there. There's three, there's three quarters of a million electric vehicles worldwide to the end of last year. 43% um, of those were purchased last year. So the number of electric vehicles in the world is increasing at a very high rate. 
But there are some environmental issues that we do need to be aware of. One is that vehicles, electric vehicles, do have a higher embodied energy. Um, that means, uh, what that means really is they take a bit more energy to produce. If they're produced in China, um, China burns coal, as I showed you, for its electricity. It's a coal-fired station on the Yangtze River. Um, the other thing is supply of minerals and rare earth metals. Um, Lithium-ion batteries require a lot of lithium, currently mined in South America, Australia and China mainly. Uh, so we'd need a, a greater lithium supply. Um, neodymium magnets, the, the rare earth magnets on the Nissan Leaf motor, we'd, we'd need more of su a supply for that. And I, all of that, I think, is, or most of it is mined in China. I want to move on now to look at the impact on the grid. And I want to look at the impact on the grid of electric vehicles in four categories. One is the energy requirements from the grid, and the other is the electricity power demand requirement. We need to think about those two things separately uh, because they have quite different effects. There's also power quality. I'm not going to have time to look at that tonight. We'd be here all night if I was to look at power quality. Um, and then I would just want to touch briefly on some new technologies coming into the grid. Now, this is a chart of um, the average daily commute, kilometres per day, um, percentile of people who do that commute. What it shows is that 90% of, av of average commutes uh, or daily trips uh, for this type of vehicle, an SUV, are around about 110 kilometres. Basically what it shows is that 90% of daily trips are well within the range of a modern full electric vehicle like a Nissan Leaf. The average trip distance is around about 30 kilometres. And this is some work done by the Centre for Advanced Engineering a few years ago and some of my staff from the epicentre helped with this work. Um, now I want to look at how much energy is required to power electric vehicles and I'm going to use that um, average daily trip of 30 kilometres. So if we did, if New Zealand had an average daily trip of 30 kilometres, what I've done here is I've looked at certain proportions of our vehicle fleet uh, as electric vehicles. So we start at 0 0.02, which is where we are now, and we go up to 100%. Uh, just look at the annual energy requirement um, and then the proportion of New Zealand's energy generation from 2014 required to power all those electric vehicles. Where we are now, doesn't even register. But let's say if we went to 10% of our vehicles as electric vehicles, we'd require the equivalent of a 54 megawatt geothermal power station. Now the Nara Arapura power station I showed you before, I think it's about 160 megawatts. So that's a you know, fairly small power station really. Um, the, the 54 megawatts is a small power station. If we went to 50% of our vehicles being electric vehicles, we'd need 270 megawatts of geothermal. That's still not a great deal. In fact, in New Zealand, we have about 330 megawatts of geothermal stations consented, ready to be built, and about 2,900 megawatts of wind farms ready to be built, consented, ready to be built. Basically, what that means is we, were, we are easily capable of generating all the electricity, energy, electrical energy required to power even 100% uptake of electric vehicles in New Zealand. So the energy demand is not a problem. But what about the electricity demand? And this here is a plot of a load profile from the maximum demand day and the minimum demand day from last year. Uh, we have megawatts here uh, up to I think the, the maximum on the scale is 7,000 megawatts. And along here is half hour of the day. We start at midnight here and go through to midnight at the end of the day. Um, and this is the peak load experienced in 2014. New Zealand is a winter peaking, winter evening peaking system. The peak load for electricity occurs in the evening in the winter. Now that top 116 megawatts of load there was present for 0.1% of the year. That's eight and a half hours. But 116 megawatts required 1.2% of the installed generation capacity in New Zealand to meet it. If we assume that that was met by a gas turbine 
at the lowest cost of 1.5 million per megawatt for a gas turbine, that would be equate to $200 million required to meet that load. And this is why uh, electrical engineers, electric power engineers get so concerned about the peak load and how to reduce that peak load because it's very expensive to meet it. And the reason the peak occurs, by the way, is what, the reason it's an evening peak is everyone comes home at night, turns on the heating, turns on the lights, the street lights come on and they start cooking. So all those things happen to coincide. Well, what would happen if we all owned electric vehicles? We all went home at night and plugged those in. So I want to just take a look at some hypothetical examples. I've got the same percentages of ownership of electric vehicles here as I showed you on that previous slide. Um, at 0 0.02, if we all plug them in at the same time, it could lead to a 2 megawatt increase in uh, electricity demand. If 10% of, of us owned EVs, it could require an 810 megawatt capacity increase. Now, notice I use the word could um, because it won't necessarily. Um, it just depends when we all turn them on. Uh, if 50% of our vehicles were electric, it could lead to a 4,000 megawatt increase in demand, which is half of our generation capacity. So that's clearly uneconomical to do that. And what we need is smart grid techniques to control when these vehicles turn on and when they should charge. And speaking of charging, I just want to talk about some of the ways of charging electric vehicles. Um, you may have heard quite a lot about uh, electric vehicle charges and networks for charging and where charges are in New Zealand. Actually, there is only one fast charger in New Zealand, and that is in Whangarei at North Power. Um, it's shown here. It's called a Chardamo, which I think is a Japanese acronym for stop for a cup of tea. Um, it takes about half an hour to charge a Nissan Leaf. Um, there is another type of fast charger. It's the European IEC Type 2, which is requires an adapter to charge the Nissan Leaf. The Tesla uses this one. Um, this is a, actually electric vehicles have the charger built into them for the AC supply. Um, this is an example of a 32 amp charging point. It's something you could install in your home, but you'd probably want to install something like this, which is, uh, that's what we use to charge our vehicle. It's an eight amp standard three pin plug, it's this. Standard three pin plug, plug it into the wall, plug that into the vehicle. It takes about seven hours to charge on a typical daily commute. Um, and there's absolutely no problem charging that. I mean, we charge it at night. It, it's the, the cost of electricity is lowest at night, on night rate, especially in Christchurch. Um, in fact, here's uh, an example of our um, electricity use on a typical day. Um, Bit of a peak in the morning, not much during the day, we're away. Bit of a peak at night. Then 9.30, the night rate starts. The timer in the car is programmed to switch it on and start charging. Um, we've provided we've plugged it in, remembered to plug it in. Um, charges, the hot water heating, and a few other things come on at the same time, but the vehicle remains charging right through to about 4 a.m. We wake up in the morning and it's fully charged. So we don't have to bother about finding a fast charging station or anything like that, unless we want to go on a long trip. Uh, but we use it for commuting in every bit of round town running we can, because it's so much more economical to run than an internal combustion engine vehicle. Now, new technologies. Um, you may have heard of vehicle-to-grid technology, where vehicles can be plugged in to the, the fast charging port, the DC bus on the batteries, and power the grid or uh, have the grid charge them, depending on price, and that's something we've looked at in the epicenter, what are, what are the economics of power, uh, vehicle to grid technology. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the Tesla power wall uh, battery that fits on the wall in your home. Um, that's something we're looking at in the Green Grid project as well, and uh, solar power. Uh, we're looking in that, at that in Green Grid as well. But all of these new technologies, electric vehicles, solar power, battery storage, vehicle to grid technology, require, uh, they have a big impact on the grid and they require electrical engineers to uh, understand them and use them and work with them. 
So I want to talk now about the skills need for all of those new technologies. Now the Epicenter's mission is to promote and support the education of electric power engineers and the study of power engineering is a field of excellence in New Zealand as well as conduct research of excellence in electric power engineering that meets the industry's needs. Um, we, in our um, past 12 years, have given out over 120 scholarships to people studying electric power engineering um, at the University of Canterbury. Uh, we give out over 30 postgraduate scholarships. We conduct field trips, and this photo here is uh, we, we take groups of 30 students away around South Island power stations and North Island power stations so they can see uh, actual power stations in operation and substations and so on. Um, this is from a field trip down to Benmore power station. Um, we bring in groups of school students to show them electric motors like these. Um, this is actually a photo taken in our machines laboratory. We teach our students about electric machines induction motors and so on, because they are so important um, in, in industry. Uh, we also teach power electronics. Remember I was saying the silicon advances have given rise to power electronics, which are so important in understanding, uh, in, in um, uh, building and operating electric vehicles. Um, <clears throat> so we set them an assignment to design a controller for these go-karts. And you can see some pretty big conductors on these go-karts. They conduct 150 amps from the batteries into the motor. Um, and then we um, have them race the vehicles and the winning, the, the students with the best designs win. Um, sometimes things go wrong and if you want to have a look afterwards, this is an example of some components on one of these that blew up. Um, if, you, you know, if you don't switch them correctly. But we do have some challenges with getting students into engineering full stop. Uh, about 10 years ago, um, there was a sudden drop in the number of students undertaking calculus in, in their final year of secondary school, and also physics. Physics has recovered somewhat, calculus not so much. Um, and this is actually covered in a paper that uh, one of my colleagues wrote, um, Shrijan Pandey. Uh, Zen and the Art of Engineering Education, which is also available on our website if you're interested in having a look at it. Um, but what is even more concerning to us as electrical engineers is that fewer students are opting for the electrical part of physics in their final year at high school and preferring to do the mechanical and um, wave parts of physics. We've looked a lot into why that happens, why that is happening, and um, in fact, uh, we're doing things in the epicenter to address that, to um, try and help students learn about electrical systems. We've just today released an NCEA electrical systems guide, which is also on our website. This is uh, it's just the beginning of it. It's a series of videos that explain things like electromagnetism, Faraday's law, um, motors, electric vehicles. This is Kelsey, one of our scholars, past scholars, um, now working for Meridian Energy, um, explaining uh, Faraday's law. Um, we also provide a very good scholarship to students and this is, these are just two of a new poster series we've produced that go into schools uh, about scholarships the Electric Power Engineering Centre provides. So that's a bit about skills. Um, we can provide all of these things with the help of our members. We have many industry members, premium members, Unison, um, a Lions company from the Hawke's Bay region, Transpower, Genesis Energy, Mighty River Power, Orion and Meridian Energy, um, and um, many other lines companies, consulting companies, contracting companies, and supply companies. Well, I just want to return to the question, what if we all drove electric vehicles? Um, as I was showing you, we could potentially get a 12% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions, New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we would also get air quality improvements, no longer have polluting vehicles. Um, New Zealand has plenty of planned generation. It's easily able to meet the energy demand from those vehicles. But we do need to think about smart grid technologies to make sure that the vehicles are turned on ch to charge at the right time so they don't all turn on at once. Um, there's challenges there with managing distribution capacity and generation capacity. It would increase New Zealand's energy independence. Um, 
it would reduce our foreign expenditure, uh, our expenditure on foreign oil. Um, but there are some questions around lithium and neodymium supplies and some other uh, metals used in batteries and the vehicles. And there is a question over the 2.7 million vehicles, that, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles that we have and what we do with those. Uh, but, you know, most of all, driving an electric vehicle, there is a feel-good factor. They are beautiful things to drive. The performance is fantastic, the acceleration is amazing, and you never have to visit a petrol station again. Thank you. That's it. I'll take questions. <laughs>